Okay, so welcome. Uh, today I am going to talk a little bit about applying the law of Demeter to GitOps, which I know is very abstract, but hopefully um, that'll become very clear shortly. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is David Mackay. You can find me on the internet as raw code. I'm a senior developer advocate for Equinix Metal, the bare metal cloud. Uh, I'm from Scotland, so I'm going to do my best not to speak in my native tongue. Uh, but I'm roughly from Glasgow, if you're familiar. As far as technologies I enjoy playing with, I, I'm really a big fan of esoteric programming languages. That means Rust, Elixir, Gleam, Go, and Pony. Uh, and I rant about GitOps regularly on Twitter. Sometimes people listen, which is great. Now, a little bit more about my GitOps journey. Um, I use GitOps for a lot of different things. So, you know, it's very prominent within Kubernetes deployments to be adopting GitOps. Um, but I also do some other really weird stuff. Uh, I like to store my data in GitOps. And in order to facilitate that, I've been working on a Rust library, or at least I had some Rust code that did this, and now I'm trying to extract it to a library. So if you're curious about Rust and GitOps, please check out gitlab.com slash raw code slash git sync. Um, and I try to provide live databases, reloading YAML files from Git and stuff like that. I'll talk about that on Twitter one day, but it's a really cool concept. Now, what about this Love Demeter thing then? What is it? Now, you may be familiar with it. Um, it's quite old, at least as far as you know computing goes, and that this law came around in 1989, 87-ish. And the whole concept of this law, the whole point of this law was to help us write better object-oriented code, to enable reuse and composability and modularity, just so that we don't you know, we don't want to write spaghetti code, right? We want our code to be clean. We want it to be reusable. And while you may not be familiar with the term, the law of Demeter, you may know it as a principle of least knowledge, right? We don't want leaky abstractions in our code. We don't want to reveal too much. This comes back to declarative versus imperative code as well. We want to write declarative code that asks for something to be done. doesn't necessarily tell the calling object how to do it. And a tell don't ask is another really cool property of the law of Demeter that you may also be familiar with. Something you're probably not familiar with is aspect-oriented programming. This is a new type of programming that spun out, uh, you know, on an alternative to OOP or functional. It has a concept called a point cut that allows you to inject a new functionality into existing code without modifying the existing code. Uh, worth checking out, but not, not something I'm going to talk about today at all. Now, when I talk about the law of Demeter, what I'm really talking about is coupling and how do we build coupling into our declarative code, whether that be GitOps or otherwise. And I want to talk about something that's already been discussed in this conference, but <laughs> I think it's really important. If we take a look at our traditional CI and CD pipelines, we store a code in Git, our CI system is aware of the Git, so it's coupled. Uh, and it does it builds an artifact of some kind. And then typically our CI system is aware of all of our environments. Generally, or at least we used to, have push button deploys to dev staging and production. Again, the coupling is leaking all the way down here. However, with GitOps that changes what we're now enforcing through, you know, what good habits we're now enforcing is that, well, yeah, our CI is aware of a Git repository is going to build an artifact, which is an image, which we can publish somewhere. And our continuous integration stage stops there. And then we have this other process. We have an operator that lives inside of our environment that knows how to work with those artifacts, that knows how to deploy them. And yes, it does link back to Git, but we do have a very explicit boundary here. The boundary is, is that we no longer have our CI system aware of all of our environments. We have a single image that can run across all of these environments. And this is a really, really strong benefit for GitOps. Now, I wanna talk about this multi-environment thing because it's actually, right, it's actually kind of painful, or at least a lot of people struggle with this. And in fact, on the Flux CD repo, this issue dates nearly two and a half years, maybe a little bit older now. It's got 53 thumbs up. It's clear to me that as people are adopting GitOps, they want to understand how do I do it in a multi-environment capacity. 
And just to remove any ambiguity here, when I talk about multi-environment, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about control flow from dev to production with whatever semantics and flow you have in between, staging, performance, QA, et cetera. Right? All these environments are different and unique and every company does it. Now back to this issue then. It's been two and a half years, this issue is actually still open. Now, three weeks after this issue, uh, someone from WeWorks themselves actually posted a link to what they were saying would be the home for a definitive or de facto implementation of how WeWorks suggests the multi-environment GitHub should function. Unfortunately, this repository doesn't have a lot going in it. It hasn't been updated in three years. And even though there's just a license and a readme, it actually has a failing build. So there's not a lot here for us to understand how WeaveWorks intended us to provide the multi-environment GitOps. And this issue is still open today, as I said, and it's still receiving comments. Right? This screenshot I think I took last week sometime, the last comment was two weeks before that. There's still a lot of people doing the GitOps journey, not really sure how to handle this, this problem. So I wanna break it down into the three ways that we have of doing, at least three ways that I see are common of handling multi-environment GitOps. The first one I list here is directory base. That means I have a repository and in that branch, whatever it's called, there are directories for each environment that we have, staging, dev, and production. Other approaches may use branches as an environment. So we'd have a branch called dev, staging, and production. And then there's one that's not really as popular, but what if I just have a repository for each environment? And I want to talk about the repository one first because it is the one that I see less frequently. But it does have one really strong benefit and that we have this great strong authentication boundary that if you don't have permissions to even see the production repository, you cannot affect or cause problems in a production environment. However, the biggest con to this and why people aren't adopting this approach is that we have manifest hell and drift. In order to propagate changes from one repository or environment to another repository or environment, very manual, very labor intensive. Um, so yeah, maybe not the best approach, but there are environments where that would be a really good one, right? I can think of financial sectors, places with high auditability. You may want to go down that route. And then there's the next lesser frequently one, interesting word choice there, uh, but branch based, right? Now this, we still have some authentication, we still have some boundaries and that we can restrict who can push to certain branches. It can potentially enable promotion through pull requests, but as we'll see, there are a lot of challenges using that too. And because of those challenges of enabling promotion through pull requests, we actually end up in the same situation of having manifest hell and drift and that we don't enable ourselves to do uh, promotion for pull requests, which means we do have very specific changes in each branch, which means we do still have to make very labor intensive and manual copy and paste to our new environments. And then there's a directory approach. This is the one that all of our existing tooling supports. We can do promotion for pull requests because it all exists in the same branch, so it's very relatively easy to make changes to one overlay or the other. But we then have no boundaries. We then have no protections, except for maybe, okay, a certain group within GitHub cannot push to the branch or requires a certain number of approvals. That's maybe okay. Again, it depends on what your environment requires. So which one do we choose? Directory approach is what everyone is doing. And by everyone, I mean, you customize, makes it very clear that this overlay approach is, is what they recommend. Uh, you know, organizations like Jetstack talk about using customized in this exact fashion as well. We have Helm providing value files depending on your environment, very similar to an overlay. Helm file then augments that further by also providing environments as a hard-coded YAML artifact that allows us to do overlays or specific configuration. And it's not just those original or older tools, newer tools coming into this space are also adopting this model. Tools like Katie are now also saying, hey, you should have environments laid out as directories inside of your Git repository. And then you compile some generation or, or YAML that tells you what our environment looks like. So let's try and apply the law of Demeter to this. What does that mean? How is this a good approach to take? 
So the first thing I want to kind of portray here is that when we talk about overlays, we're saying this is inheritance. If you've written any object-oriented code, then this is classic inheritance. We have some base description, some base class. We they provide the ability to extend that class. Uh, <laughs> and depending on your background, you may see a warning sign there saying, oh, if you've only ever done object-oriented programming, maybe it's what you're familiar with, and that makes really good sense. But me, as a functional programmer, it makes me a little bit worried. It makes me a little bit of concern. And that's because we have this coupling. What we're saying here is that by using directories as a way to explain or explicitly define a new environment, we have this two-step process. If I want to deploy a new environment, I have to commit something to my Git repository with a new directory, tweak it with the values or overlays that I require, and then push that up. Now, that can be good or bad. Again, that depends on your use case and how you're applying or approaching this situation, but that may be a really good selling point. But for me, I have some concerns. And what I also want us to understand is that not all environments are created equal. Now, you may want auditability on your production branch, maybe on staging, but as the priority of those environments decreases, or the, the frequency in which we deploy new environments increases, that's a decision that we have to make. So what I want us to understand is when we do multi-environment GitOps, we have to distinguish and we have to first acknowledge and identify concrete environments versus ephemeral environments. And I know I don't like being the it depends person, but the way that we approach our GitOps depends on how we wish to treat these concrete and ephemeral environments. Now, production, of course, is a concrete environment. However, do you only have one production? Now, I know that's a question where a lot of people are going to say yes, but your production, could your production environment could be multi-region. It could be multi-cloud. There could be more than one production that we mesh together in certain fashions. And what we want to do with our GitOps here is make sure that we only ever target the Kubernetes API, not the cloud provider, not the regions, not the third-party services. And depending on how you've approached this in the past, what I want us to take away here is that the way that we provision and deploy new environments is completely isolated and separate from the applications that we deploy to those environments. We don't want any leaky abstractions. We don't want any coupling that is going to affect the way that we do that. Now, of course, you can still get ops your environment provisioning, right? As, as long as we keep them separate. So let's talk about some actionable tips that allow us to not break the coupling, or at least not in, introduce coupling that we don't explicitly want. Now, the first one I have to say is just really be cautious with the examples that we see online. I know from experience of speaking with people, uh, <laughs> speaking with people, that you know they go down this directory approach to GitOps because there's just so many examples of it online. Now, I was doing research in preparation of this talk and looking at all of these examples, and I can tell you they're all trivial, extremely contrived. The customized example is this. The only overlay modification it makes for the production is a name prefix. Now, there are use cases for doing overlays in this approach, but we need to identify them first. They have to cause us problems before we adopt the directory approach. So really be careful there. We also have to understand the variance and invariance in our applications, right? And anything that is going to be unique or has to change across our environments should be deployed with the environment provisioning. A really common thing we see in, you know, there are talks on this, there are blog posts on this, is using things like sealed secrets and SOPs to source secrets in our GitOps environments. Now, I'm not going to tell you that storing secrets in your GitOps environments is wrong or bad because there are use cases for it but we need to understand that we only store the secrets that are ubiquitous across all environments as part of our application GitOps. And anything that changes with the environment should live with the environment provisioning. The environment provision should, the environment provisioning should provide an environment that we can infer and adopt and you know, look up these values. And I really, I don't see enough of this either, right? The things that can be randomly generated within the environment should and must be randomly generated. That means when we store random strings to uh, encryption salts and keys in ephemeral environments, 
we can generate them uh, application deployed them. And there are a few projects out there. I'm just going to highlight one here, but the Kubernetes secret gen uh, generator is a really good approach for this. You can see the manifest here is nice and simple. We add an annotation that says add a new field to the secret and it's going to be a password. There are other ways to customize it, size, length, uh, character classes, etc. Now, this is where some people may get a little bit, whoa, do not use the replicas field in your deployments, right? And what I want us to really do is that that is, a, again, all the examples that shows how to do overlay based GitOps. Replicas is the thing. And dev, I only want one or two. And production, I want a uh, hundred million of them. Well, we actually want the application to function the same regardless of environment. So let's just always use the horizontal pod auto scaler. We can set the minimum that our application needs to function and a max that we need uh, for each of, for our production environment. And then we trust the scaling within our application, even in dev staging and production, just to do its thing. And that should just become the norm. We shouldn't replica override per environment. And another maybe controversial point is I, I really feel that we have to limit auto commits by machines because of the amount of problems those cause. And those have been mentioned a few times now. For concrete environments, yeah, definitely. Maybe there is a great use case for auditability purposes, but do you really need that? And identify that first before just going with the status quo and saying, I am going to commit all of the image resolutions that happen in my cluster back to Git. There is, and maybe another way to handle that. So just identify if you need that for your concrete environments. I also want to give a shout out to Capitan um, by the DeepMind project because they're one of the few tools that I've seen that doesn't promote overlays by default. As a functional programmer, I really like it and drawn to it because they offer composition techniques for aliases and targets and other things. So definitely check that out if you're looking for a new way to declare your application manifests. And what does all these actionable tips, what does this all enable? Well, it pushes us on the path to have branch-based GitOps, where we have concrete environments in green, dev, staging, and production. We have uh, ephemeral environments in yellow. Every time we work on a new feature, we can spin up an ephemeral environment. Every time we have a PR to staging, we can have an ephemeral environment. And we use our concrete environments as a basis for building those. Now, back to this example, there was actually really good content in this repository. It was just hidden. And it's a shame that it hasn't been updated because I feel that WeaveWorks were trying to approach this path initially and maybe just got led down the wrong path through examples of customizing other tooling. But this repository... Okay, I'll just... Uh, 10 seconds to finish. So we can use... Uh, uh, yes. So we've got environments here and we can use the branches, development and staging. And this enables us to have no overlays and allows us to have explicit concrete environments and limited read-only ephemeral environments. And we still have environment parity, we still have branch protections, and we still have promotions with PR. Oh, wrong way. Uh, thank you very much. That was my talk. <laughs>